A great story is should be cathartic escapism. We don't have great stories that are cathartic escapism, they're just escapism. When you start selling cinema tickets like they're drugs, you basically emotionally and psychologically traumatize an audience over time, where it gets to a point where people are going into the cinema and buying tickets, but they're actually feeling nothing, because what's missing is the hidden architecture of storytelling and psychology. You have to make sure that everything you're putting in there is in service of the story. And it feels like there's too many things that writers and directors have to try and find a way to incorporate into their films that don't service the story. When we say servicing the story, what we actually should be saying is, well, we're servicing the collective and individual psyche of our audience. And there are some things which collectively bond us together and a story will resonate with that. And there are some things which are idiosyncratic in each of us. And the story should reflect that as well which is why the greatest stories all have a polysemic nature. Polysemic means that you can read them in one way or another. So they have subtext. So stories that ostensibly, like Jurassic Park ostensibly, is a story about a theme park of dinosaurs. Sure, that's the text. You know, what if we create dinosaurs? But the subtext of that story is established in the very opening scene with, with Ali, uh, Alan and Ellie, where after he attacks that kid looking at the Velociraptor bones, um, as they're walking up the hill, Ellie says to, to Alan, she says, you know, if you wanted to, to scare the kid, you could have pulled a gun on him. And he's like, yeah, I know, kids, like, you want to have one of those? Suddenly, so like, well, what does that mean? It means these two people are having a conflict over what they're going to do with the future of their relationship in regards to having family and kids. Go to Jurassic Park, what happens immediately when they arrive? Grandkids of John Hammond arrive, become surrogate children. The subtext is, the story isn't about what if we could clone dinosaurs, it's what if we had children? And then the backdrop of Jurassic Park simply becomes a, a, a canvas upon which to paint that very familiar set of problems of parental responsibility, maternal and paternal responsibility, relationship to kids. That's where great storytellers like Spielberg are servicing the subtext of what the psyche of the audience wants to, to digest. Whereas people that, that use policy-driven propaganda so they don't say well let's have subtext about inclusivity they say well let's write on the very surface of our script that we're going to tell the audience that they're not being inclusive enough that's where you get these um people feel manipulated and when people feel manipulated they don't buy tickets they don't they don't want to be schooled they don't want to be preached at they just want to be feeling like they're actually participating in something without being manipulated which is what these other stories fail to do now because they're so politically driven. The box office speaks for itself and the free market really wanted to watch Top Gun Maverick. Tom Cruise and, and Skydance and Paramount were very meticulous and deliberate to not put any politics in that movie. Now, if you look at that movie, they don't even, they don't even name the, the country in which that final mission takes place. It is completely devoid of political statement. You know, it's classic 80s values, basically. Do you think part of the reason that these sequels have done so well, you mentioned how people aren't feeling anything, but do you almost think that for the audience, that's a benefit with so much chaos going on around them that filmmaking almost acts as a form of self-soothing? And if they don't have to feel anything, that's fine because everything outside of the theater is going poorly for them? Yes and no. I think that ultimately film is a form of catharsis. People, you can call it two things and they mean the same thing. Like therapy and escapism are the same thing. Like when you go to therapy, you're going through a, a form of escapism from your current mindset. And when you go to escapism, you're, you're numbing yourself to your current mindset. A great story is, should be cathartic escapism. We don't have great stories that are cathartic escapism, they're just escapism. So you go and watch Jurassic World Dominion, there is not a single spiritually enriching, emotionally enriching, sociologically enriching idea in any of those godforsaken sequels. None. It is bereft of meaning. Meaningless, utter crap. And that is because it's generated by people who are only capable of generating utterly meaningless crap, which is the executive producer class that just has very shallow values and is exporting it to the rest of the world. People are tired. People go to the cinema to feel connected and to feel resonance with themselves and with each other. That's, that's why films like Jurassic Park hit such a universal audience. The future of storytelling is, is returning to something that actually has some emotional or spiritual resonance and these films don't they're just if jurassic park is like a nutritious meal that just enriches your body 
than Jurassic Park Dominion is just like sitting with a box of, of, of sugary, poisonous candy. Sure, they're both digestible, but one of them is going to make you feel better and the other one's going to make you very, very sick and over time will kill you. When does it make sense to actually do a sequel? There's a quote from David Fincher and I'm butchering it, but it, it's to the effect of a script should be the reason you make a sequel, not an excuse. By that, what he means is the only time you should ever make a sequel is when an idea that's so strong has pushed through into the minds of the writers and they've generated a script and they say, this is actually a great sequel. Let's go and see if a studio wants to make it. What happens most often is it's the inverse, which is a studio says, well, which franchise can we, can we like drill for more profits now? They identify what franchise is ready to be resurrected. They set up a writer's room with no clear idea of why there should be another sequel, just that there should be. And then suddenly what you have is this committee based, well, okay, well, how can we justify spending 200 million and marketing a sequel to this film just to gain profits when there's not actually an idea there? For example, I worked on Blade Runner 2049. That wasn't a, a script that was developed because of studio interest. That was a script that was developed because the original writers, or the, let's say the, the script writers who, who were tr you know translating Philip K. Dick's work, they saw an opportunity to tell a new story in that world. And they developed a script that was really, really strong. And then it got shopped around in, in highly private circles. And then Denny Villeneuve came across it and, and thought, I love the original Blade Runner. This is a great script. And I will make it because I don't want anyone else to bugger it up that in his own words, because I, I, I just didn't want anyone to fuck it up. So ultimately it's, it's the idea should, should demand to be made. The studio shouldn't demand an idea to be generated. But yet they keep demanding that they be generated. And so yeah, is it yeah, yeah. purely a financial thing? I, I think things move in cycles. So we've, we're reaching the end of a, of a so let's say multi-decade process where film studios have spent so much time investing in rehashes and reboots and sequels that the audience, the, eventually the free market, votes with their with their ticket buying. It's been effective up until now, but it's a bit like, the best way I can think to describe it is that when you start to see cinema as you start selling cinema tickets like they're drugs, there comes a point where for a certain period of time you can keep cutting the quality of the drugs and for a short period of time, you'll actually make more money because if you half the quality of, you know, a bag of heroin and your, your addicts don't get high on it, they'll come back and buy a second bag. It's a bit of a weird analogy, but the point I'm making is that when you don't give people the satisfaction they're looking for, for a short period of time, they'll just buy more hoping that they'll get that fix. But eventually you, you basically emotionally and psychologically traumatize an audience over time. It's like Chinese water, water torture, where it gets to a point where people are going into the cinema and buying tickets and buying streaming. But they're actually feeling nothing because the material that's being generated in huge quantities is just ossified, self-referential, lacking in originality, lacking in any spiritual or emotional depth. And then eventually what happens is just the, the sales dry up, which is what we're seeing with, I don't know, what is it, phase whatever of the Marvel franchise, that there comes a point where you're pushing, you're pushing on a piece of string. So 20 years ago, Marvel was a solid stick that you could push you know, into the market and, and, and it would affect the market. Now it's like having a piece of spaghetti and you're pushing it, but it's just not having any effect on anything. I'm curious what the feeling is you're looking for when you're watching a film. It needs to resonate on a level that is, let's say, psychologically true to life. And and for me, there's two sides to getting that resonance. There's a, there's a technical side to storytelling, which is that there's got to be cause and effect. There's got to be consequentiality. There's got to be establishing a clear psychologically and emotionally relevant pattern of problems. And then there's got to be a believable set of reactions and actions that characters take to solve a problem. On the one side, there's the technical aspect of storytelling, which is that not like a mechanism, but just as a series of consequential actions, it's got to flow in a way that, that is real to life. And really, th th I think that's ultimately what was missing for me when I watched something like The Force Awakens, is I can feel, and I can also articulate on some degree when I analyze a film, what's gone wrong in the writing process that leads to the absence of that feeling. And what's useful about films like Force Awakens is you've got a clear ability to do a side by side, which is, Okay, well, here's this thing that made millions of people, billions of people feel something for 40 years. 
and here's this new derivative of that thing, which is clearly divisive in its reception in the world at large. So then you simply say, well, what's what's happening? What's changed? What's Let's do a side-by-side -side comparison, especially because The Force Awakens has so many surface-level attributes that are are lifted from the original, but what's missing is the hidden architecture of storytelling and psychology. I've been studying James Cameron for the last couple months, and what he always does with his sequels is he takes the, part, the pieces people love, but he presents them to you in a new way. And with The Force Awakens, it felt like they were just trying to recreate the original film in a modern context. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can speculate about what's gone on in the, in the process behind the scenes on The Force Awakens. First of all, whereas the original film is handled by a few individuals in a kind of very focused creative flow, when you get to a behemoth like Disney handling a sequel, it's going to be basically a creative process of committee, which means that, okay, well, this executive producer with a relatively big ego and a lot of power has decided over the weekend that they really liked a scene from the original movie and that they can tie it in with, you know, some gimmick with some modern actor. And then that becomes the primary drive of the writing room is to now bring in this extrinsic, completely arbitrary feature of some executive producer. I think that what James Cameron does so well is that because he's a tor he's a force of nature, he gets to maintain such a, a high level of creative control that it doesn't get diluted by committees and by extrinsic factors. So there's less people challenging James Cameron, which also can backfire, as George Lucas found out with the prequels, and I would say James Cameron's found out with Avatar. I think that you do need constraints from the outside world to, to push through. For example, when he was asked to do a sequel to 782, he, for a very, for, very uh, for a series of reasons, which are quite obscure, I'll, I'll just summarize it. He had to get a script out in two weeks before the Cannes Film Festival. That pressure, is like they squeezed out a diamond in two weeks. And I actually think that that is a very healthy thing sometimes when you've got a creative like James Cameron is to say, no, you don't have 11 years to work on the sequel, James. You've got two weeks. That makes you think in very clear, bold terms. Okay, well, I've, I've got this original film. It's Sarah Connor. She's, she has to survive the, the assassination of the Terminator in order to give birth to John Connor. She's a, a kind of soft, doughy waitress, and she turns into something that's far more kind of empowered and independent. Well, how do we invert that for a sequel? Well, she goes from being in power, driving off into the to the stormy sunset on the Mexico highway, with a with a John Connor in her in her belly, and then the first time we see her again in Terminator 2, she's considered a psychopath and she's in a mental asylum. So her entire world has been thrown upside down. All of our preconceptions have been turned upside down. That immediately finds the ability for you to say, well, okay, well, what's this story about? And it's about a mother and son relationship. It's about finding redemption, rekindling a broken family relationship. And then suddenly you see that the Terminator, Sarah and John suddenly become metaphorically speaking, placeholders for family dynamics. And boom, it's no longer time travel. It's about the reunification of a broken family and trust and uh, finding faith in humanity again and finding faith in a loved one. And suddenly those are human themes. Cameron's very particular in, in establishing genuinely good family, psychological, emotional dynamics. Is that a thought that comes out consciously or is it a subconscious thought that he doesn't necessarily realize he's doing when he's writing that story to make this family dynamic? Is that something as storytellers you should be thinking of in the moment or is that a subconscious thing that just comes out without even thinking about it? Cameron's watched my analysis and he's, the feedback was, there are things in here which I'm not conscious of, but I accept are there. There are things here that are attributed to symbolism when they're actually just technical choices that were consistent. So style basically being a, a side effect of consistency in technical execution. And there are some things that, uh, you know, he thinks is just completely overseeing things. But the one takeaway that I took from from the feedback was that he, he basically said that he had no cog, uh, conscious un, uh, knowledge of Joseph Campbell, the monomyth, the psychological kind of building blocks of story. He was just riffing, you know, unconsciously. To me, I, I think that's a completely makes complete sense because all Joseph Campbell's monomyth theory is effectively a codification of unconscious patterns. Naturally, the unconscious creates those patterns and the conscious encodes them. But you don't have to have any knowledge of the conscious patterns to be able to unconsciously bring forth ideas that just resonate. So yes, I think it's largely, almost exclusively the unconscious and the conscious brain is just there to 
double check, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's effectively and, and just make sure that everything's tight. For those that are unfamiliar, how would you simplify what the monomyth is? You could call it a theory, but it would be better to call it an observation. There was a guy called Joseph Campbell. He was a cultural anthropologist, which means that he was like an archaeologist for, for human psychology across time. He was fascinated by how there were parallels between the stories of, say, the Christian Bible and then the Navajo Indians. Uh, he was raised in America and then he went and studied, went and traveled the world, went to like Papua New Guinea, went to South Africa, went to the Inuits, and basically started to catalog all of their myths. And he, he eventually realized that all the myths might have slightly different like labels or they might have slightly different variations in, in the dynamics. But ultimately, the dynamics of these stories were all basically the same. Like every tribe disconnected from time and space was generating something akin to the, the story of great sacrifice of Jesus Christ of, you know, and he, he distilled it all down. And once he distilled down all these various clouds of knowledge, he just sort of began to work out that there's actually a kind of model, which he called the monomyth, which is effectively a 16 stage circle. Uh, and the 16 stage circle, if you really distill it down, you realize that it's, it's effectively just a metaphysical distillation of all psychological change. So you start in a certain position in the ordinary world, you're confronted with the fact that you need something in order to, 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 to make your suffering less. You go on a journey into the, the world of the unknown, you search, you find something, you take it, you return to the normal world and you're changed. And that's the, that's the simplest model that I can think to describe it of. So there's you, you need something, you go, you search, you find, you take, you've returned. That's the, the, the building block of the, the hero's journey, but how it expresses itself has got infinite permutations because every single person has different has has very peculiar needs and journeys and contexts in which they travel through life so one person's need is different to another's but ultimately that metaphysical skeleton underpins all of evolution and that's why it's the building block that you can use as a framework for making stories is if your story follows respects that natural cognitive tendency of us to see the world in that cycle uh, and if a story respects that cycle and it's scary because every hollywood movie that's been successful every single one of them you can you can basically show that despite all the idiosyncrasies there's a consistent structure underneath it, a skeleton that joseph campbell called the monument you know that's why that's why george lucas could make the original star wars was because he studied the anthropological texts of, of uh joseph campbell and joseph campbell was studying human history over thousands of years across the whole planet and distilled it and george lucas was learning from that so star wars as a futuristic science fiction was the result of deep historical study people that that study the classics and really become an expert in the classics and how they work and why have a far more significant edge in the future than the people that have just watched the latest Star Wars movie. And then that plays into the subconscious, right? Because if everyone's studying these traditional stories, the format of the future stories are going to be modeled after the monomyth. And be, as viewers, we're so used to seeing stories in that structure that subconsciously it feels good to us when something does follow that structure. Yes. It's like it just, when it when it's there, it clicks. It's like, to give you an example, because it sounds reductive, right? It sounds like, oh, well, every story can't be the same because that would be a very violent reduction of of what you see to be a very vibrant world but to give you some context like every person that you've ever met has a consistent structure of a face two eyes a nose and a mouth and that consistency in the structure is what allows for expression you've met 10,000 people in your life you don't walk up to the 10,000th person you've met and go you know what i'm getting really bored of this facial construction that you're using here like you just don't do that it, it, it's a prerequisite for communication and for value expression. So those people that, that understand that will be able to make, will be able to, to harness that structure to express something meaningful. And ultimately, you can look at The Matrix, Lord of the Rings, Shawshank Redemption, Die Hard, Jerry Maguire. It doesn't matter. They all follow that pattern. And when they follow, it just clicks and we resonate with it. It makes us feel a combination of humble and hopeful because you see problems that people are going through. You see the challenges they face and it's, it becomes a source of inspiration for your own life. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the reason that it exists is, is that it allows us to, to pass on that model across generations. Is there a time and place when you should deviate from that structure? You can totally deviate. You can break struct like that's what Picasso did. Like he learned his craft of painting, but then he he basically became 
uh, against structure in some sense, or he broke structures. That's what a lot of, you know, indie movies do to some degree. But ultimately, if you stray too far from structure, you end up with noise. You know, for example, Tarantino is a great example, like Pulp Fiction, classic hero's journey. What has he done? The same thing that Nolan does when he chops up his timeline. He breaks apart the, the sequentiality, so you have to put it together for yourself. But when you actually look at the individual stories inside of Pulp Fiction, you, you align them back up. You'll see the classic, there's you, you need something, you go, you search, you find, you take, you return, you changed. You know, take um, Butch. So he starts, he's in a pickle, he's been asked to throw a fight, which is against his moral principles. He chooses to effectively betray Marcellus Wallace. He then goes, and then he realizes that he can't escape without getting his gold watch, because his gold watch represents his integrity and his, and his father's heritage, etc. He goes, he finds it, he takes it, gets in a dungeon or comes close enough to it, and then he's returned, changed. And at the, the end, at the end of the story, you get what's called atonement which is that at the beginning of the story, there's this this uh, issue of integrity and conflict between him and Marcellus Wallace, and at the end, there's atonement. And both characters have changed from that journey, and both of them have either reintegrated or integrated new values. It reintegrated old values, such as the, the gold watch, which is Bruce Willis's fa uh, Butch's father's war watch, and Marcellus Wallace has integrated a new level of respect, because at the beginning of the story, he, he sees Butch as basically just a joke that he can just buy out. Once you actually look at these, these patterns, Tarantino understands what's going on. He just has a very strong talent for obfuscating some of that architecture so that you don't feel like you're being hit over the head with it. And that's what storytelling is, is finding new ways to say old things.